Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic in March of 2020, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and on this service, on Sunday morning broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we are about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our shared faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, this fall, in this year when so much is uncertain, we know that transformation is necessary. This is the place. This is the time. Who will we be? How will we be? In a time of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what are we called to be as a community? This is, as Reverend Susan Frederick Gray puts it, no time for a casual faith. And this right here, right now, is where we practice. And as Susan Frederick Gray puts it, this is no time to go it alone. And so this right here, right now, is where we practice together. So take a moment as we begin. Be present right here, right now. Let go of what you've carried here. Set aside what will come later. Just be right here together. There is work to be done. Let's be about it. Our chalice lighting words this morning are from the Gray Hymnal from a Passover Haganah. May the light we now kindle inspire us to use our powers to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to bless and not to curse, to serve you, spirit of freedom. Hello. Our story today is called A Child of Books by Oliver Jeffers, and the illustrations are by Sam, 
Winston. I am a child of books. I come from a world of stories. And upon my imagination, I float. I have sailed across a sea of words to ask if you will come away with me. Some people have forgotten where I live. But along these words, I can show you the way. We will take brave travels over mountains of make-believe. Discover treasure in the darkness. We can lose ourselves in forests of faint tales and escape monsters in haunted castles. We will sleep in clouds of song and shout as loud as we like in space. For this is our world. We're made from stories. Our house is a home of invention where anyone at all can come. And that is the end of our story. And just like with books, I wonder what is next for our church. Thank you for joining me. One Sunday each month, we take up a collection to support the work of a local organization. The Share the Plate recipient for this month as voted on by our members last spring is Voices of Hope. Speaking on their behalf will be Sue Anderson. Hello, I'm here with Sue Anderson. She is the Community Education Coordinator and Advocate for Voices of Hope, and I'd like to welcome you here with us today, Sue. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you in this kind of different format this time and share a little bit about Voices of Hope. So, as Jean said, my name is Sue Anderson. I always talk first of all about the fact that I do have the best job at Voices of Hope because being the community education coordinator, getting lots of opportunity to come out and meet um, people in the community, talk about the agency, the services that we provide, the issues that we work with, and then the advocacy piece of my position is really the opportunity to provide those direct services to victims and survivors, and that is very much very much an honor to walk alongside people. So for those of you who might not be aware, Voices of Hope is a domestic violence sexual assault program, serves Lincoln and Lancaster County. All of our services are free of charge and confidential. And we provide those services to all genders. So we really talk about being a place to empower people who have experienced relationship violence, sexual assault, stalking, and other forms of abuse. Then our services are also available for significant others. So really, um, the unfortunate reality is all of us are touched by these types of crimes and know someone who's been impacted by that. So services are for, for all of us. I would like to for your past generous support of the agency, the Unitarian Church and membership has always been so supportive of Voices of Hope in a number of ways. Um, and we were Really appreciate and really value that. Just perhaps to highlight just a couple of our services that we provide for some who might not be aware. Main services is our 24-hour crisis line, always available, <clears throat> always having that trained advocate uh, available for things that are happening. Also doing 24-hour advocacy in the hospitals and the court system, drop-in services um, in the, in the um, office when, when when the office is open and then really that community education training piece of going out into the community and providing information about these issues to other community members first responders kind of gatekeepers who work alongside us doing this work people come to us in a variety of different ways we have as i mentioned the, the crisis line which is often a one of that first first contact that folks will have with us we do have cooperative agreements with the police department and the sheriff's department. So when someone is lodged in jail for domestic assault or a violation of a protection order or sexual assault, um, 
law enforcement does contact one of our enhanced advocates and gives us information. So that would be one of those times that we would do outreach and make a call out to that victim, to that survivor, to talk about safety planning, to offer different services, to see how we might be of help to them. So we do have a lot of community partners that we work with being involved in the threat assessment team, serving on a sexual assault team, coordinating response teams for domestic violence as well. This current situation that we're all in, the global pandemic kind of changed some things for us and changed um, some of our fundraising abilities. So we've had to cancel a number and then have really looked um, to our resource development coordinator and other staff to be more creative in how we services to the community. So I thank you for the opportunity to share with you um, during this service today. Thank you for being here. We hope that you'll consider a contribution to Voices of Hope right now to support their important work. You can give through a check, just write Voices of Hope in the memo line when you mail it in. You can give through your online database realm, or you can send a text right now. Just text UC Lincoln space and the amount to 73256. That's UC Lincoln space and the amount to 73256. Just follow the prompts from there and select share the plate. Thank you. The following words are from the poem Sad Song by Rick Ocasek. Too many screamers wearing a mask, too many dreamers looking for the one that lasts, too many eyes looking for hope, too many tears looking for a way to cope. It's no joke. It's just a sad song that pulls you along. It's just a sad song when you hit head on. It's just a sad song that pulls you along. It's just a sad song and it won't take long. Too many thoughts breaking your stride. Too many jekylls feeling like Mr. Hyde. Too many clouds darken your day. Too many raindrops falling on your thunder bay. Every day. Too many heartaches waiting to strike. Too many clowns claiming everything's alright. Too many fires scorching your mind. Too many preachers saying what you should find. They see the signs. While we've certainly had any number of clowns telling us that everything is all right, we are lucky to have a community and a preacher that understands that these unprecedented times contain multitudes. We take time out of each service to celebrate our joys and speak our sorrows. This Sunday is no different. And if there is someone that you're holding in your heart, either in joy or in sorrow, Please type their name in the chat box.
Welcome to another Fireside Chat brought to you by the 150th Anniversary Committee. I'm Mary Kay Stillwell, and today I'm going to talk about our prime movers and guiding lights, women in the UU Church. For 150 years, women have provided all sorts of services and performed many roles in support of our church, fundraising, religious instruction, caretaking, They've given sermons when there was no preacher and played piano, violin, and harp when there was. They've been social advocates, attending protests, writing letters, testifying before legislative committees for equality and justice throughout our history. We have much to be proud of. When I started out, I was going to offer an overview of women's activities from the First Lady's Aid on through Cake's for the Queen of Heaven. But my subject has morphed into a deeper look into just a few women from the past who can continue to inspire us. As William Faulkner wrote in Requiem for a Nun, the past is never dead, it's not even past. These women who have gone before us offer stories that I believe give us courage for the hard work that we know is ahead. I thought I already knew Mary Monell uh, and who she was until I ran across the newspaper account from July, 1876. The headline reads, Lawn Party. One of the happiest affairs it was ever our pleasure to attend was a lawn party given last evening at the residence of J.D. Monell on 18th, the corner of H. We doubt if there are any grounds in the city as suitable for entertainment of this kind than those of Mrs. Monell. And the way they were laid off on this occasion showed excellent management. Ice cream and other refreshments were kept on the north side of the lot. The tables were placed along the side where all kinds of suitable refreshments were served. A plank walk was put down leading around the south side of the house And there a fine platform for dancing, 30 by 50 in size, was erected. The article goes on for a while about the party and its splendor and the fun they had, and then concludes, dancing commenced at a seasonable hour, a portion of Pryor's orchestra finishing the music, furnishing the music. The evening was so pleasant and the scene scene so beautiful that nearly everyone remained outside and nearly everybody in the city was there. Mrs. Monell is to be congratulated over the brilliant success of her undertaking. Well, that story made Mary Monell human to me, and I wanted to find out what I could about what it was that brought her to Lincoln, to live, to dance, to found a church. The city's first newspaper, the Nebraska Commonwealth, founded in 1867, advertised opportunity and wealth to Easterners, hoping to lure them out to the new state. But by then, Frank Welsh was already here. He was an engineer by training and served on the Nebraska Territorial Council. He became registrar in one of the land offices where folks could file for a homestead, and then later became U.S. Senator. Important to our story, is that in 1862, Frank Welsh traveled back east to Massachusetts to marry his longtime love, Elizabeth Butts of Hudson, New York. While he was there, he may well have encouraged his new brother and sister-in-law, Joseph and Mary Manell, to join him and Elizabeth, Mary's sister, out west. By 1868, Lincoln had grown into a city of 500, and Joseph Monell arrived to open a lumber yard to take advantage of the city's continuing growth. Most buildings were wood frame. It was a good career move. Joseph and Mary, along with their teenage daughter, Kate, came to live on H Street, not far from the site of the First Universalist Church that Mary would so tirelessly um, work to build. Liberal religion was firmly planted in Hudson, New York, where Mary was born in 1828. Quakers were among the first white settlers of Hudson, and the Universalist Society organized a number of churches in the area in the 1840s and 50s. 
Thanks to Mary, our church followed their pattern with an initial organizing group and a church building following a year or two when funds were collected. Following the Panic of 1873, however, the Universalist Society could no longer provide funds for a pastor. Although she was in California visiting her daughter by the time the society could send Reverend uh, Chapin to Lincoln in 1883, Mary must have been elated by the good news. She was never to return to Lincoln, however. She became ill and passed away in San Francisco. Even This is Enough by Vanessa Southern. So much undone, so much to do, so much to heal in us and the world, so much to acquire, a meal, a healthy body, a fit one, a lover, a job, a better job, proof we have and are enough just around the corner of now. And up against it, the reality of all that falls short and the limits of today. We honour the limits. If your body won't do what it used to, for right now, let it be enough. If your mind can't stop racing or can't think of the word, let it be enough. If you are here utterly alone and in despair, be all that here with us. If today you cannot sing because your throat hurts or you don't have the heart for music, be silent. When the offering plate goes round, if you don't have money to give or the heart to give, let it pass. The world won't stop spinning on her axis if you don't rise to all occasions today. Love won't cease to flow in your direction your heart won't stop beating. All hope won't be lost. You are part of the plan for this world's salvation. Of that I have no doubt. The world needs its oceans of people striving to be good, to carry us to the shores of hope and wash fear from the beachheads and cleanse all wounds so that they can heal. But oceans are big, and I'm sure there are parts that don't feel up to the task of the whole some days. Rest, if you must, then, like the swimmer lying on her back who floats, or the hawk carried on cushions of air. Rest in pews made to hold weary lives, in space carved out for the doing of nothing much but being. Perhaps, then, you will feel in your bones, in your weary heart, the aching, healing sense that this is enough, even this, that we are enough, you are enough, enough. So what do we do now? A week and a half after the presidential election, it seems to me that there are two big questions for us as a community and as a country. How do we move forward after this election? And what are we going to do about the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic? The theme for worship for the month of November at this church is healing, which seems appropriate to both of these questions. One thing that's come up often in the last months is that this is a place where we can be honest about brokenness. Victoria Safford writes that these are places where we can tell the truth of our own soul and its condition, first of all. And so, I can say my soul is tired. This week, I want to relax and not think about national politics for a little while. And I want to not look at COVID-19 numbers for a little while. 
because our collective soul is wounded right now. Clearly, I was relieved preaching last week. But just as clearly, that was not the only reaction to the election. There are 70 million people in this country who experienced last week much differently than I did. And we're going to have to reckon with that at some point. In the last two weeks have also seen the COVID-19 pandemic here in Lincoln go from concerning to critical. Hundreds of people a day are now testing positive for the virus. And we are going to have to reckon with that. So what do we do as people of faith? First, I would say that a project of the mature soul um, is knowing what we are not. Self-differentiation is a good thing in our collective lives as much as in our individual lives. So what are we not? We're not a healthcare agency. We're not a public health agency. What does that mean? Simply that it is not our job in this place as this church to solve the pandemic. There are people and communities who are working on that. Our role as we go into the next months in the ninth month of this pandemic is to listen to medical advice, to do what we can to keep transmission rates low and to stay together as a community. That's all. Our job in this place is not to cure the COVID-19 pandemic. It's not to develop a vaccine. It's not to figure out how to distribute a vaccine. It is to weather this pandemic, to come out the other side as intact as we can be. Our faith says that each person has both inherent worth and tremendous potential. So simple acts of preserving life, of wearing a mask, of not gathering in person, finding ways to mark the holidays in joy without putting ourselves and others at risk. These are acts of faith. These are acts of our faith. We are also not in this place an arm of the Democratic Party. Now, this gets a little fuzzy. Most anyone that's listened to me over the last months could easily infer who I voted for. But our role as a church is not to endorse or campaign for particular candidates for office. So you will not get a full accounting from the pulpit of every cause that Stacy and I support every fundraiser that we send checks to. Our role here, as an in the church, is to proclaim our vision in the world. We are a loving community. In this vision, reason and spirit are complementary, not opposed. And we are about the work of transformation of building more just, more humane, more just human ways of being in the world. And practically, it's an unavoidable observation that most of this congregation probably voted in a similar way two weeks ago. And that we have plenty of members who are active in the Nebraska Democratic Party. Just as a political party should not be a fully simpatico arm of any particular faith, so should our faiths, at least in this place, at times call us to different things than a political party would. That's the theory, at least. Here's the blunt practice of it. I know that many of us are relieved that Joe Biden is, was elected president. I'm relieved at that. And it would be so easy to think that's the end of the story. 
the good guys won. And so now we, and certainly the church, can take a break. Well, take a break if you need to. But know that we have a lot of work to do. That vision statement doesn't say to transform ourselves and our world when there's a Republican in the White House. So we have a lot of work to do regardless of the result of an election. This year, the congregation is engaging with the Movement for Black Lives, doing the internal work of transformation in order to be better allies in the work. This year, we're recertifying as a welcoming congregation, making sure that we are as welcoming to our trans and non-binary beloveds as we claim we are. We are continuing the sustainability work that this congregation is known for through the work of the Green Sanctuary Committee. This Thursday night, at Vespers and right after, we'll get an update on that work and about how to get involved. The work of transformation continues and it is hard work and it is, it is a religious project as much as it might occasionally resonate with a political one. Our task is building the beloved community. That's a vision that has been held in churches for centuries. Sometimes that corresponds to policies. Sometimes that corresponds to inner transformation. Sometimes it corresponds to being out in public saying, we don't know what justice will look like, but it is not this. Sometimes the work of transformation is about creating a world that does not yet exist. And sometimes it's about saving something that is precious. We have no single responsibility in this moment greater than this. We need to do everything that we can to keep as many people as we can alive and whole during this pandemic. It would be easy to think in this moment, there are vaccines coming in the medium term, and hopefully in January, the people coordinating the national response will be better so we can relax. Things are looking up. Friends, I say many times that there are many good ways to be a Unitarian Universalist, and that's true. But on this issue of the pandemic, in the winter of 2020 in Lincoln, Nebraska, there is little room for nuance. Wearing masks saves lives. Staying home when you can saves lives. Finding safe ways to connect electronically to lessen an isolation and infection rates saves lives. And these are not hypothetical lives. 57 people have died in Lancaster County since the pandemic began. And that, those are not statistics. Those are our neighbors. Those are people that some of us knew. And that number is not going to stay at 57. And so our single overriding concern right now is keeping ourselves and keeping each other safe. So it is my expectation that we will do everything that we can to mitigate this pandemic. Just as it is my expectation that we will continue to be a place of love and transformation in the world. Vanessa Southern writes about healing, that we are enough, that the world won't stop spinning if you don't rise to every occasion. But Rabbi Tarfan would add, you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. Healing doesn't happen by accident. We are called to bind up the broken, to build the promised land that can be. That's who we are. That's our calling. We're not a political party. We're not a public health organization. We're a church. 
trying to build the beloved community as best we can. So take a breath when you need it. Stay safe. And remember that here we are about the work of transformation. Blessed be and amen. Will you please join me in singing our closing hymn, number 121 in the gray hymnal, We'll Build a Land. We are called to be people of transformation, called to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. That's who we are. That's who we will be going forward through the pandemic, through whatever comes next. Remember that. Be the church for each other. Stay safe, stay connected. And we'll see you next Sunday. Amen.